Hello! Here we are again with the Great Writer Steel Experience. Today, our very first proper interview. A great writer by the name of Jack Gems. We'll talk about her new book. We'll talk about her process. All kinds of great stuff. We'll also learn about a great indie bookstore, Women and Children First. We'll talk about a book you should buy. A great book, a novel that I highly recommend. And in Better Know a Buckeye, we'll talk about the great and one and only Aaron McGraw. So sit back, pour yourself a color teeny, and let the digital ones and zeros fly through the air. All that and more, right after this. You know, a lot of people have been talking about farming lately. They're looking for a farmer who does things the old-fashioned way, but with a modern twist. Why, these folks need to know about the Manor Farm. It's the only place of its kind, friend. Farmer Jones III and his porcine partner Napoleon XVI work together to ensure you get the best organic vegetables around. Some farms brag about their free-range meat. At the Manor Farm, the animals are free. Maybe you haven't heard but their guarantee is painted right on the barn. Sure, all chicken is good, but some chicken, well, it's just better. Our old major brand ham is recognized far and wide as the best on the market. Do you want to talk about green farming? The Stone Windmill has provided all the electricity the Manor Farm needs since 1945. Some folks whistle while they work. We... (laughs) We like to sing the hours away. Feasts for England, feasts for Ireland, feasts for every land and climb. (laughs) You know the rest. The next time you're looking for quality meat and produce, trust the Manor Farm label. You'll recognize it. It's on a green background. It's a hoof shaking a man's hand. Better yet, why not pay us a visit? Say hello to the dogs at the front gate. The Manor Farm. If you look from the competitor's product, and from theirs to ours, and from ours to theirs again, you'll know which is which. All right, we are here with Jack Gems, the author of the book A Different Bed Every Time from Dezank Books, Uh, something you should check out. Hello, Jack. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for coming on. Uh, The book is very interesting. There are many short stories in the book, Uh, all of somewhat shorter lengths, no uh, no giant uh, T.C. Boyle length stories here. Uh, would you tell us uh, a little about yourself? Sure. Um, I live in Chicago. I was born and raised here, um, so I haven't really left for the most part. I went away for undergrad for a little while, but, um, but yeah, generally a Chicago person. Um, I This is my second book that's come out. My first book of stories, the first book was a novel, and um, yeah, I work a regular nine-to-five job and write with as much free time as I can get. Oh, yeah, that's definitely a problem, getting free time when you're doing a lot of other things, definitely. Um, I guess the the main thing that that, uh, that I found curious in the book, and obviously obviously, I'm you know not making any uh, criticisms, we're just trying to figure out you know, what's going on so we can kind of borrow from you. Uh, the stories are all kind of short. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's not a bad thing. What was your goal? Were you, uh, do you think you are, have more of a poetic mindset? Uh, do you think less implied? What What were you thinking? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think that I like a certain density of language for the most part, and so I think that does lend itself a little bit, at least um, in the work that I've done so far, to a shorter length to um, to make it a little bit more manageable. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that I like to work in miniatures. I like to look closely at a certain situation or relationship. Um, I think that I definitely have work to do as far as being able to sustain longer plots and so um it's something that i'm interested in and always trying to work on but um but yeah i do i realize that the pieces in this collection do 
read almost more like poems in some ways because of the dense imagery and um, and the focus of language. And just in the way that I write them, it, language is generally what's driving them for the most part anyway. Yeah, definitely. Um, on, on page 120 in Prison Windows, one, one of the things that I really liked was uh, your use of verbs, uh, the unanticipated way that you used verbs at times. Uh, for example, in that story, uh, you write, They tell stories. They want to let their nightmares gesture around in someone else's ears for a change. Um, I liked I liked the use of the of gesture as a verb. That's uh, part of the density of language that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, I guess gesture is often used as a verb, but that's so, maybe ge- not the noun that it's often paired with. Uh, gesture, right. G E S T E R. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. I should know my own story better, right? No, no, it's my problem. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not the greatest elocutionist around. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yes, I am always trying to combine language in ways that is exciting and new to me. Um, and, yeah, I'm just trying to surprise myself, basically, when I'm working on any of them. Uh, well, do you have any, any tips for how to surprise yourself with words? Uh, I mean, just for example, I, I will, I'll mishear a song lyric, and, uh, and, and I'll put the wrong word in my head, but then I'll realize, hey, I, I kind of made that up. Like, I, you know, I can steal that now. Uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how to, how to use language in an unanticipated way? Yeah, actually, a lot of what I do before I start working on something is gathering language from other sources. So that's pretty perfect for um, for the name of your site and the the themes that you explore. I steal a lot. So what I'll do is I'll just sort of scan pages of books I'm reading and pull out the words that are most vivid and exciting to me and try to um, pair them in ways. So I'll just, I mean, it's just a, an exercise in trying to, um, to match things up in a way that I wouldn't normally do or that I wouldn't normally just think of without having the words right in front of me. But, um, but yeah, I like what can happen when you create something like uh, when you combine nightmare and gestures and what image that calls up and... Um, and so that's one thing I do, just randomly pairing words and seeing if I can make it work and then seeing if I can bridge the gap from that image that I've created to the next image, the next pair of words that I've made. Um, that, and then I also um, will look at texts in other languages that I know poorly. So <laughs> There you um, go. <laughs> So, like, French, I took four years of French in high school, but I'm still not even close to fluent in it. And then I have been trying to teach myself German for a while, but again, just pretty terrible. And um, I'll try to read something complex in one of those languages and translate it, but for the most part, um, it's wrong. You know, like, maybe I'm getting... 25 to 50 percent of it right but the way that I force myself to bridge those little gaps with cognates and things um it it creates for some fun language too uh I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit because uh I I had five and a half years of German instruction and and I can I can understand children's books and celebrity magazines that Mm -hmm. that that I've got uh Are, do you regret at all that you that you as a, as you said don't have uh, the ability with another language that you have with English? Oh yes, absolutely. It would be um, yeah. If I had one thing that I could change about myself, I think it would be that I would have like stuck with language beyond high school. What happened was I took. French, and then I tested out of all my requirements in college, so I just stopped. But what was I thinking? That would be so wonderful. And then I feel once, like once you've got a second language fluently, then it's a little bit easier to jump into the third, and then that could have just opened up a whole word, wor- other world. And then, especially as a writer, um, understanding how other people in the world 
what what tools they have to express themselves language wise because I'm I, I mean this isn't anything new that I'm saying but it obviously shapes the way that you think and interact with the rest of the world the the words that you have to to do that yeah um, I, I've definitely found with uh, some in, I, I guess there's no better word for it than international writers like uh, really great writers who you know do have another language and uh, but they write beautiful stuff in English uh, they, they put together sentences in uh, it's definitely obviously correct but in in they put together unanticipated sentences uh, because of maybe the way that their their brains were trained when they were children yeah yeah I think that um, I love when you hear about words that certain languages have that there's no way of really translating into English. You can sort of approximate it with maybe a whole sentence to explain what that word means, but, and German has so many of those. German has those huge, long, compound words that <laughs> oh, definitely, <laughs> yeah. describe things in such extreme detail that we don't have. Yeah, we, I guess we're more metaphorical with it, I suppose, than in German. Yeah. They, they're very factual when they put them together. Um, I guess a, a, as an, an easy question, or I guess a basic question, uh, I don't know how many times we hear writers talk about it, but you had all these stories. Uh, how did you decide the order they would they would be placed in in the book? Uh, that's a good question. I um, the first thing I did was decide what stories would go into the book because, believe it or not, I didn't just put everything in. I tried to have some uh, sense about what stories as different as they might be felt like they could live in the same world and obviously there are different um, ends of that spectrum uh, but I did that first tried to find stories that didn't um, stick out too far from the others um, and then I uh, I put everything, every title on a note card and started shuffling them around and tried to think about pacing, tried to put stories that um, might have a little bit of an accent to another story uh, near each other, but if the two stories were maybe too close or too similar in tone, space them out a little bit. Um, I, I still don't know what the right answer is as far as, um, like, where do you put the strongest story? You know, you want to open strong and finish strong for right, sure, right. But, um, but where do you, you know, you don't want it to be really strong for the first hundred pages and then lag for a while and then finish in an epic way, you know? So, um, so I tried to evenly pace things as much as I could. Uh, yeah, you never know what a writer is going to or a reader is going to do. Are they going to start at the beginning, read all the way through? Are they going to look yeah. for the shortest ones, the longest ones, the right. most attractive title? Uh, I, in reading the book, I wondered if the epigraphs of the book kind of guided, maybe they guided your choices. You have quotes from Barry Hanna, Gary Lutz, and Eileen Miles. Yeah, um, I don't know about guiding my choices, but um, but they were things that had stuck in my had been sticking in my head for a good long while and um, and those are definitely three writers that I admire and had been reading a lot while working on all of these stories so um, so I would be lying if I said that those quotes came first and then the stories came second but I think it's oh, a little sure, more yeah. jumbled than that but um, but yeah I do think the um, the three of them individually make sense with a certain sensibility I had around these stories and then also the way that they kind of all add up uh, was made sense to me and I think a lot of the way that I think about my own work ends up being not collage, but um, just what the the way that things add up, the way that uh, different images and events and characters and how it all just sort of pieces together to pull together a picture rather than having a stronger um, 
through line of this is the story I want to tell. I like the idea that, uh, well, I guess I think that it's closest to my lived experience that you don't really know where things are going or what to expect. You just sort of figure out what it is you're looking at or living by pulling together all the disparate parts. Uh, well, it's interesting that you say that because one of the things that I thought you did really well in the book was uh, the, the first sentences of the stories. Um, I guess, for example, uh, every night I stunned myself with gin. Uh, when I was 14, I was diagnosed with scoliosis, which basically kept my spine trying to sneak west. Uh, the, the, the introductory lines uh, seem to, even if they didn't propel an, an extremely strict narrative, uh, they, they kicked off the, the images that you were going to use and, and definitely grabbed us. Uh, is Thanks. that... Yeah, no, no, yeah, definitely. Uh, is that an indication that either the line came first or the image comes first generally for you? Or how does that generally work? Yeah, I do think... Um, I th think probably a lot of the first lines of this book did come first, and then I sort of followed that voice as I was going through... That I am sure that's not true in every case. I'm sure there oh, was a yeah, lot. There's a lot of stories, so yeah, know, definitely, I, yeah. Yeah, obviously everyone, um, you know, you sort of often start writing the story before you know what it's going to be, and then you have to cut the first page or two because you realize what it was you were actually You're just working at. up to it, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, whenever I'm working... A lot of things are image-based, and then you always want to start strong because you do want to grab the, the reader and set up what the rest of it is going to be, whether it's plot-driven or image-driven or whatever. Oh, definitely. Um, I liked a lot of the variety in the book. Uh, I particularly enjoyed... Uh, well, I, I guess it's because I'm, I'm a, a narrative guy. I think that's just my writing orientation because, uh, you know, I love plot and I love story like for my own work. Uh, I loved, you know, uh, bent back and the tackiness of souls, uh, people trying to connect and, and not exactly being able to get it together. Uh, but I, I love the anomalies as well. For example, uh, Head and Heart uh, about uh, about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, how did that come about? Was that was that you writing to a, a prompt or a, a solicitation, or was that just I'm, I'm curious about TJ? <laughs> no, it was to a prompt. Okay, um, yeah, definitely. Melville House, around the election time, uh, yeah, I think just a couple years ago, I think it wasn't the one prior to that, um, was putting together a series of fiction around U.S. presidents, and so they asked uh, a bunch of different writers to uh, to write stories based around presidents, and we got assigned them. And I was lucky enough to get Thomas Jefferson. That's a good I mean, one. How much That's better can one, you get? Definitely. Yeah. The Louisiana Purchase. That was fifteen million dollars. Yeah. We got a third of the country. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so I guess what you're what you're saying is something that I I like doing is where uh, uh, you you write to a solicitation or you know you see. Uh, you know, respond to the. We want poems responding to this poem. So, uh, not only does it cut down on some of the competition because not everybody has a poem in response to a random poem, uh, but it's also uh, does it help? Did it help you in terms of uh, coming up? You didn't have to come up with everything. You were given a pre-planned idea to some extent. Yeah, actually, I would say sometimes that feels tougher to me because you do have. Uh, this expectation to fulfill and normally I can just be loosey goosey and go wherever I want to but yeah there are a couple stories in the collection that were prompt based I know um, there's one called The Direction of Forgetting and it's about um, the spice trade yeah. a trip out to, um, to gather spices oh, that's that was also yeah. a prompt one uh, there's a uh, series that's ending now, sadly, because I loved it so much. But um, I don't know if you've heard of it, the Encyclopedia Show. I believe I have, yeah. Yeah. So they, um, so every month they do a different theme, and they invite a variety of writers to come in, and um, they give them an assignment. So, so for that one, I think, um, I think it was just the the theme of the show was spice. And then um, 
people got all different uh, topics within that. So some people had like the Spice Girls, or um, <laughs> I don't even remember, but the Spice um, but Channel. I got the Spice Trade. So then I had to write around that. But um, it's fun. I like doing research. I wish that I. I, I think that maybe soon I might pick up a project that requires quite a bit of historical research because it's something I'd like to try. But for little stories like that, it's so fun because it's so finite and uh, manageable. Oh, definitely. Uh, so that's something definitely that we we should all kind of steal is uh, even if we don't want to be forced to write 100% to a prompt or to, uh, you know, somebody asking for something. It, it does expand uh, because you have to do a little bit of research or maybe ape a different style or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it brings a lot of words and terms and uh, events into your work that you might not expect. You know, if you're reading about what the history of the spice trade is and the triangles of trade routes and things, um, you know, there's all sorts of these really uh, beautiful names of plants and uh, and places and uh, all of the navigation stuff. There's all just all of this um, this maybe history that you hadn't delved into. So there's more for you to write. It, it just I think. Um, researching these like topics that I don't know a lot about it just really fills up uh, my imagination and gets me motivated I, I think it definitely helps with with words as well probably especially you know for you uh, when you read uh, contemporary accounts and the the writing will seem weird you know it's been translated from the Spanish 300 years ago into English and so you're you're reading all kinds of different uh, kind of archaic sentence constructions or words that aren't generally used anymore um, and on that topic I found it interesting uh, in a few of the stories you you adopt a uh, dialect or, or an alternate diction for example in uh, before we pass this way again and engrossed uh, it's not full-on dialect uh, but but it's kind of uh, the 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 narrators are uh, are definitely not uh, the same. Uh, they're not using the same language as in the other stories. And so I've always been curious about dialect. After I read, uh, their eyes were watching God. So w what is your kind of philosophy with respect to dialect? Um, well, I think those two stories. Yeah, the, I, I see what you're saying, that their uh, language is a little different than some of the others. So Before We Pass This Way Again definitely has more of a southern or country sound to it. Definitely, yeah. And then um, Engrossed is, um, is me just being more playful with language and pairing plural and tense, plurality and tense and... Uh, conjugation and that kind of stuff and just sort of messing with that little bit that the reader has to hold on to. It, it might also take the, the reader out of their preconceived notions of language to some extent yeah. uh, and kind of shake them, especially, I guess, in the middle of a, of a collection that's not, it's not too long, by the way. It's, you know, it's a nice length. It's definitely uh, not a slog. It's definitely a book people should pick up. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah, I worried about having that. I think it's 42 stories and like 160 pages. So I worried about that being a bit much for people to get through. But they're all so short. Oh, definitely. Uh, but I, it's kind of like a balancing act. Uh, maybe the, the, the brevity of the narrative is balanced out by the, 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 the power and the compactness of the language. Mm -hmm. um, I have... Some questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions that that writers don't often. At least I've never. I usually don't hear people ask about them. Uh, how do you usually compose your first drafts? Um. So, so a lot of what I do for first drafts is sort of what I was talking about, putting together these strange, um, like combinations of language, and then trying to figure out how to get from so cheesy but how to get from stepping stone to stepping stone so if I have this sentence and then I know that I also have this other sentence what needs to fill up that gap to make that make sense um, uh, so so it really is driven by language at least in the beginning and then um, maybe as I'm continuing to work I'm getting a handle on the character and I might use those 
um, those little prompts and um, like catapults a little less uh, and I might get farther without an assistance of that nature and then maybe pull in another one and and sometimes the language creating then becomes a little more organic and I'm not just using these um, these tools that I've made for myself uh, but I'm able to just make them up uh, as I go along I know that's a really strange way to work. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it yeah, seems it's, like it's what keeps things exciting for me. So that's that's typically a first draft. Yeah, it's not literally a collage what you're talking about, but it has that the kind of energy and uh, and the kind of playful joy of of a collage. Uh, do yeah. You, do you generally uh, type your first drafts into a computer? I, I like to use fountain pen. I don't. You know, a lot of people do different things. Oh, sure, yeah. So a lot of the language gathering I do is just in notebooks, but then really I, I only type as, um, as I'm actually working on a story. I, um, yeah, it's just, it's too slow to, to write on paper for the most part for me, which might make everything better if I, if I went to the trouble of slowing down and really, uh, being careful, but. Yeah, everybody does what works for them. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and so how does that, how, what does the revision procedure generally look like? I, I don't like revising. I don't know how you feel. Yeah, no, I don't love it either. I feel like that's where the real work comes in. The first draft is all play, and then you have to take a step back and look at what you've got and ask yourself how you can make it better. So, um, so revising, I mean... I feel like this is going to sound really vague, but generally it's just me going back through the piece over and over again until there's nothing that makes me uh, cringe. There you go, yeah. Like there, until everything feels uh, like a moment of, oh, yeah, that was good. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, still got it. Um, no, just cutting out all the parts that make me uh, think, oh, that could be better. Yeah, I, I'm I'm working on a young adult novel and I'm I'm almost done and uh, I I'll, I'll I'll read a, a section and I'll say I cannot believe I wrote that who who was typing up that who did that it wasn't me. Yeah, no, I um I know that feeling. Yeah, sometimes it's terrible to go back in those moments and sometimes if you've got a little bit of distance and you've been thinking oh that thing that I wrote back then was so awful sometimes you go back and you think you know this is like. 60% good. I just need to work on it, you know? <laughs> that, I, I, I wish that I were thinking 60% about mine. That's good. That's good. Uh, well, yeah. and, and we also often don't talk about uh, what, what is your kind of general submission procedure uh, when it comes to things? Obviously, everything's a little bit different, but, but how do you approach submitting stories? Yeah, I used to be addicted to submitting work. I, I, I saw, yeah, on your blog, uh, you chronicled many, many rejections. We're all, we're all, we all have many, many rejections, so. Yeah, so yeah, don't that's feel nothing bad. different. But I think that um, for a long time, I was just really uh, attracted to the affirmation from get, submitting work and either. Just the attention of having it uh, <laughs> turned down or uh, or accepted, and I got really into just the anticipation of waiting for an email to come in saying that a story had been accepted or something. I've calmed down quite a bit uh, in the past few years, and I'm thankful for that. It means that I can take my time a little more and um, and focus. I was putting a lot of energy into submitting. I would, at any given time, I had a piece of writing poems or a story out to three different places, and as soon as a place rejected it, I sent it out to another one, and I just had this monstrous list of, of places to send work to. And I think a lot of that was helping me figure out where I wanted my writing to go and what my writing community was, who they were, um, because the people that accepted my work ended up being the people that... Um, that I do think that my work most closely aligns with, at least in some sort of sensibility where, you know, even if I'm not writing like uh, like the other people that are published by X magazine, there's something, uh, there's a similar quality or, um, or s openness to some aspect of, 
of literature. So, um, so I think it was good to be obsessed with that for a little while, but I do appreciate the, um, the chance I've given myself to slow down a little more now too. Um, I'm a little, uh, yeah, just a little slower in how much I'm working and, uh, and what sorts of things I'm working on and figuring out what it is I, I really want to commit to and spend the time on. Because time is so hard to find. Oh, definitely, definitely. Well, and, and I guess speaking of that, uh, do, you, do you have any narrative guilty pleasures, you know, in like reality TV, uh, you know, things that, you know, everybody wastes a little bit of time on stuff like that. Do you have anything like that? I do. I go through stages of reality TV. I definitely do. Lately, I, I, um, I wasn't a big person into The Real Housewives but oh, all no. of a sudden, somebody made me watch The Real Housewives New Jersey, and I got <laughs> very into that particular plotline, I'm not proud to say, but it was um, sort of all-consuming for a little while. And then um, also true crime. I love true crime. I love shows like uh, Unsolved Mysteries or oh, Autopsy. Sure. sure. I love all of that. So, uh, and then reading true crime too. If it's um, if it's a really solidly built narrative, I do really like to read narrative-based stuff. So uh, a lot of times, I think that what I like to read most is actually writing that's farthest from what I do because I think I have so much to learn from it and because I don't get caught up thinking about uh, necessarily how closely it compares to what I'm working on. Oh, definitely. I think we're all that way. We, we push ourselves with the, with the media that we, that we consume to some extent. Uh, or at least I hope we do. We should. Yeah. Um, do you have a... And I'm curious, do you have any, uh, like, any mentors in writing who, who deserves a shout-out? Um, I mean, I feel like the people that are close friends who are writing and just doing amazing things are endlessly uh, encouraging and exciting to me. Um, Lindsay Hunter and Amelia Gray and Zach Dodson and Aaron Birch and Blake Butler, those are all just um, just really uh, encouraging and um, and inspiring such a cheesy word but um but i'm just constantly astounded with what they're doing and i could only hope that um that i've learned something from them but then also i would say a shout out to one of my grad school professors beth nugent because i think that the most valuable thing i learned in studying writing was how to ask myself good questions and knowing that the only person that knew what questions should be asked and then knew how to answer those questions would be myself ultimately so obviously you want to give work to other people to read uh, and get their take on it but um, but the most important thing is knowing what it is you want to write and then seeing how um, being able to tell when you've accomplished that oh very cool um, and then I, I guess we'll finish up uh, what should we look for next from you um, I, I mean, I'm working on more stories. I've been trying to work on essays. I don't know that I am very good at writing essays yet, but it's something that I'd really like to become better at, and I'm working on a handful of them right now and have had a couple out in the last year. And then um, I'm, I have a novel that is in, like, its fifth draft right now, but it still needs a lot more work. So that hopefully fun? that'll come into the world at some point. It's always a lot of fun when you're on the fifth draft and you still need to add stuff and take stuff out. Uh, but every, yeah. definitely, uh, everybody out there should look for a different bet every time. Uh, Jack Gems, thank you so much for coming on with me and uh, telling everybody about your process, uh, the way you approach writing. It's a huge help to all of us. Thank you so much for having me. This is really great to talk to you. All right, thank you. Thanks. I am the only bookseller. Resistance is futile. Your book buying as it has been is over. From this time forward, you will shop with us for books and garden hoses and cars and aerators for your faucets. Are you looking for a book about a woman? Perhaps a book written by a woman? 
Well, Women and Children First in Chicago, Illinois is happy to help you out. Uh, it's under new and equally awesome ownership. You can find them at 5233 North Clark Street, right there in Chicago. Our featured author this week, Jack Gems, is a former employee of the store. Uh, you know, they have a lot of great things going on. Uh, if you check out their website at womenandchildrenfirst.com, uh, you'll see that they have a beautiful corner store with a striking pink awning. Uh, more importantly, they host book groups, local authors, uh, and they have a pretty extensive event calendar. For example, in October 2014, uh, there are some great writers who will be there. In October 2014 alone, the bookstore will be host to great writers like Eula Biss, Greg Shapiro, Francis McNamara, and D.M. Perone. A lot of great things going on. I think what I appreciate most about Women and Children First is that they're dedicated to being a part of the community. The communities need great bookstores. They're not just a place to buy books. They're a place to share ideas, meet friends, uh, bring a cup of coffee, sit down, talk about the news of the day. These are why we need independent bookstores and why we have to trade the slightest amount of convenience that we get for the great benefits that we receive by having a brick-and-mortar bookstore in our hearts and in our neighborhoods. So go ahead and check them out. Like I said, that's Women and Children First Bookstore in Chicago, Illinois. You can find them at womenandchildrenfirst.com. Book you should. Book you should. Book you should. Book you should buy. Ladies and gentlemen, this book you should buy is indeed a knockout. It's Fobbit by David Abrams. Now, I reviewed this book for Late Night Library, uh, and I loved it a lot. It's fantastic. David Abrams, uh, he worked for 20 years in the military as a journalist. During his time in Iraq, he kept a journal that became the basis for this, which is his debut novel. Now, I guess you will find a, a lot of books that are funny, even though they're about war, but obviously this book, like all the others, are respectful. But what I loved about the book is that he treated all the sides fairly. It, the book isn't aligned with any particular ideology, as I say in my review. The book turns the difficult trick of making you laugh while reminding you of why war is so horrible and why we wish we didn't have to do it so much. In many ways, I say in my review, Fobbit reveals that the true story of the Iraq War will be told through documents. Each development in the book is charted in requisition forms, marching orders, situation reports, and the countless sheets of paper destined to grow dusty in army warehouses. Abram writes with great humanity and great attention to detail. There are heroes and villains in every battle, but the truth is never that simple, and the actors are always more complicated. If nothing else, you should pick up Fobbit because it's a fantastic debut from a writer from whom we will hear a great deal. The book is just fantastic, so... Go out and pick it up. O-H! I-O! O-H! I-O! Go Bucks! I've been really lucky in a lot of ways in my personal, professional, and writing lives. One of the greatest strokes of luck that ever happened to me was having Erin McGraw as my teacher. In fact, it's hard to tell whether she's a better person or writer or just better as a human being. Uh, I know that's kind of hyperbolic, but there's just a, a, a sense of calm and competence that exudes off of her in ways that you don't often find. So I'm very jealous her, jealous of her in a lot of ways. Uh, I guess what I'm most jealous about is her incredible writing. Ladies and gentlemen, please do check out her books of short stories. These include Lies of the Saints and The Good Life. You can pick those up wherever books are sold, especially independent bookstores. Uh, in 2008, she released her latest novel, uh, The Seamstress of Hollywood Boulevard. This one's a historical novel. Uh, you'll enjoy it a lot. She it goes very deep into the inner lives of her characters, even though all of her characters are just a little bit different. Uh, and if you're looking out for it, please do. Her next book is coming out very soon. It's going to be released in the spring of 2015, and it's called Better Food for a Better World. Uh, she chronicles some of the experiences 
Uh, maybe not that she had. I don't want to apply all of the events to her. But as she says on her website, it is in part a love song to that bucolic, marijuana-tinged California town, the kind of place that she says she grew up in. You may also have the luck of being able to have her as your teacher as well. Uh, if you notice that she's on the listing for a writer's retreat or that kind of thing, go ahead and sign up because she will help you a great deal. Uh, and she'll also become a kind of friend to you because she's just that kind of great person. So go check her out. Now she's expert with sentences and puts together the beautiful music with words. I think that she's particularly skillful at helping people understand the structure of work, uh, the structure of novels, the structure of short stories. So if you need help in that particular area, as I certainly did, don't hesitate to study under her or, obviously, read her books. One more time, that's the great Erin McGraw. So what have we learned today? Well, first of all, Jack Gems is a great writer. Women and Children First is a cool bookstore. David Abrams' Fobbit is definitely a book you should buy. And of course, Aaron McGraw is someone we should all know. Thanks so much for listening. That's all we have for this time. Remember, I'm Kenneth Nichols. This is Great Writer Steel. And remember, Shakespeare did it. Why shouldn't you?